Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We have a really good episode lined up for you today. We're going to start with this blog article that was released by Microsoft where they talked about a lot of phishing attacks have been going on and it's a campaign that has been targeting more than 10,000 organizations actually starting last year in September of 2021. And it's a type of attack that we actually went over in one of our shows called Evil Jinx. And if you haven't listened to that episode and where Adam and I go over how Evil Jinx works and what that attack is basically how it how attackers use that attack to compromise email and your credentials, you should go back and listen to that because we go in detail of it. But a high level overview and Adam in the pre-show, you kind of assumed based on the name of the articles and the news that was coming out that this was probably evil jinx. And, you know, when we went over the article in the pre-show, we confirmed that it is, and it's a, a couple other of open source phishing toolkits, but Evil Jinx is one of them. So basically, Mm -hmm. the attackers are stealing credentials and session cookies. And by doing that, they're able to bypass MFA. And the way it essentially works from a high-level standpoint is that there's a proxy server set up somewhere, a web server that will show a very similar sign-in web page. So from a phishing email, a link is clicked, it redirects you to a web proxy and then shows you this email or I'm sorry, this web page, which looks very similar to your Microsoft sign in page. And then you sign in and using that web proxy, they're able to steal your session cookie. And once you steal the session cookie, you don't need to reauthenticate, therefore bypassing MFA. And so that's a wide scale campaign that Microsoft through their threat intelligence has discovered that is happening and has affected a lot of organizations. So one, one note there, Andy, uh, you buried the lead a little bit. The web page just doesn't look kind of like the login page. It is the login page because that proxy is sitting in between the user and the destination. And it's actually serving it through there. And so for users who aren't terribly sophisticated, they're not going to pick up on this because guess what? That proxy sitting there in the middle, it can still support SSL for your connection from your client to them. So the padlock will appear. Um, And again, because it's serving up your actual page and it's just sitting in the middle, if you have custom company branding or anything else, that's all going to be there. So the only way for even you know, a reasonably technical user to catch that this is happening would be to look at the URL in the browser. Unless they catch that, if they proceed through, you know, harvest their credentials, their username, password. um, And then, like you said, grab that session cookie as it's transmitted and replay it um, and use that to regain, to gain access, which can defeat, um, you know, some, some controls like MFA, um, unfortunately. So, it's a uh, it's a really sophisticated attack, and you know, thankfully there are ways to mitigate it. But just want to clarify there that um, this isn't something like you can really train your users like really easily to detect. Um, a lot of the mitigations basically involve forcing machines to do that detection on our behalf, um, because this is this is practically impossible to train users. Because again, nothing's going to be out of place because it is the sign in page, you know, and um, there's only one hint that it's not the legit location. So it's, it's very devious. One of the things, since you mentioned that Adam is also, if you have, you know, different URL rewriting technology and users are used to seeing, you know, the URLs being written anyways, that also can complicate things because they're just used to seeing a bunch of jarbled stuff for, Mm -hmm 
those URLs when they're clicking on stuff. So sure. Yeah. If I hover over the URL in my email client and it's uh, protection.proofpoint.com, blah, 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 blah. I can't even use hovering over the URL as a methodology to, to see it. Um, so that's not terribly helpful either. That's another good point. So even some of our tools actually work against us here, um, depending on what you're using. That's not a problem for customers that use Defender for Office 365 because it does, even though there is URL rewriting, um, the, the Outlook client will actually show the original URL anyway. So that is still a, a methodology for um, people who use that. Exactly. It uses the Office API to redirect on the back end once you click on the link. So mm -hmm. there are ways to defend against this. Mm-hmm. One of the you know, recommendations, actually, you know, we've talked about this several times from CISA, from, um, you know, our security uh, recommendations, but you can move to a fish resistant MFA uh, style, which is essentially uh, like a FIDO2 um, or certificate based authentication. And so that's probably going to be the, the best defense against it. Um, you can also use conditional access policies for Microsoft, at least, right? So if you're using Microsoft, you can use conditional access and then um, scope in things like uh, a compliant device or a uh, IP address, like a trusted IP address. And so those are things that you could do as well. That way, you know, even if they stole the session cookie, if they're not coming from a compliant device and you have to er enroll in Intune in order to access company data, then that will thwart the attack as well. Mm -hmm. You can also invest in some anti-phishing solutions. If you don't have a secure email gateway, obviously that's kind of table stakes these days. Uh, so you do want to have that something like uh, Defender for Office or Proofpoint or Mimecast, you know, one of those um, secure email gateways where they're scanning the emails and uh, doing URL detonation and um, payload detonation uh, attachments, all sorts of stuff like that. And of course, obviously continually, continuously monitoring um, any type of suspicious activity. Um, if you're able to have the bandwidth to hunt for um, different sign-in attempts, uh, you know, if you're a Microsoft uh, customer and you're using Azure AD, Azure AD has identity protection and there's going to be, you know, impossible travel or um, sign in from an unusual IP or um, infrequent travel to different countries. You know, if those are popping up, you know, those are ones that you may want to take a look at because um, that for sure can signal something like this. And finally, if you are an M365 Defender customer, there's actually a an alert uh, for using edge and the session cookie that if for uh, if the attacker tries to steal the session cookie and use it with an edge it'll actually show um, an alert that says an attacker is trying to replay a, a stolen session cookie to access exchange online so that is a unique um, alert for uh, m365 defender customers mm -hmm. yeah and and just want to go back to if you want the most bulletproof method that solves this 100%, it's FIDO2 and fish resistant um, methods like that. So uh, shout out to our friends over at like Yubico, for example, and YubiKeys, 100% um, eliminate and solve for this risk. So it's a great idea actually for say your administrative accounts, maybe to force them to use fish resistant methods to sign in. So at least you can have confidence that those uh, admin credentials aren't getting stolen. And if credentials are stolen, they're from a non-privileged user that can at least help. Um, conditional access, Andy, you said it as well, but just reiterating, if you're doing that compliant device checking, it does thwart this as well. Um, because that, that proxy server is not enrolled in your management solution and can't pass that check. So it won't get access. It won't get a session cookie to steal. Um, and so that is a, honestly, a place you should be getting to anyways, as part of building your zero trust architecture. Uh, but once you get to the point where you're doing that trusted device check, that does help thwart this as well. So that's another, um, thing to look out for 
and, and try to get to. And really, I think if you as an organization are doing that, where for your privileged accounts, maybe you're, you're mandating the use of uh, fish resistant tools, um, like a YubiKey, and then for maybe your rank and file users, you're at least doing a compliance check on their endpoint. That is going to solve 99% of this, right? And so we talked about this uh, one or two shows ago where we were saying that, you know, it's a cat and mouse game with defenders and attackers. And eventually MFA was just going to be table stakes that they were going to routinely be able to defeat. And we are starting to get to that point. I mean, when we're talking uh, 10,000 organizations impacted, like you can't just kind of, you know, pat yourself on the back and say, Hey, we implemented MFA. We've solved identity compromise. And I know nobody listening to the show is saying that, but the point stands that we have to keep moving forward and getting to that zero trust, like architecture where we're melding, all of these identity-based detections, real-time detections with the, the health status of the endpoint, with the health status of the EDR solution, and, and considering all of those signal every time we make an access decision, that can really, really, really help um, mitigate a lot of this risk. Again, not eliminate, but mitigate. And that's kind of a place where we want to be. So scary, but manageable. And manageable through the solutions everyone kind of already knows they need to do, but this maybe can be an impetus to accelerate your efforts and to accelerate um, that movement forward for sure. The next bit of news that I wanted to chat about Adam and I, we actually got some questions from some of our customers. So we thought we'd present this and, you know, hopefully answer um, some questions you might have. So, Microsoft earlier this year announced that they would block VBA macros on download documents by default for all customers. And then last week, uh, Microsoft announced that it would roll back the change based on user feedback, which of course does raise some security concerns, right? Um, I think anyone who's in IT and security can understand because even if you go through the proper channels, the communication, the change management, you know, all of that still always includes a rollback plan because every change has risk. And so when you do a change, sometimes there's unintended consequences, even if you've tested it and all of a sudden it needs to be rolled back. But the security concern of course is because You know, Microsoft Office has contained these automation capabilities or active content. Um, Most commonly uh, used are these macros in the Office stack. And um, malicious actors have been using macros in Office for years to deliver malicious code and and payloads. And so decades even. (laughs) Right. And so, you know, being able to disable them by default was a good thing. Um, it, it helped protect a lot of, um, you know, companies and organizations who, you know, might still be using them. And I think that's probably the issue is that they were still using them and probably for business purposes. And now all of a sudden they were blocked. So for anyone who may not be using macros and you're worried about trying to, you know, shore up your defenses, you can still block them. It's not that, Microsoft took away the ability to block macros. They just took this feature where it was blocked by default. Um, And so you can still block them in your organization via group policy for your office apps like Access, Excel, PowerPoint, Visio, Word. Um, You can block them using uh, Microsoft Endpoint Manager uh, or Intune. And, you know, these are mostly through uh, internet macros. Right. So anything that you download from the Internet um, that may have a macro. Now, additionally, you can also deploy the attack surface reduction rules that we did have another episode on a few weeks back for Windows Defender Exploit Guard. That is on top of, you know, just the plain GPO and uh, Intune uh, profile, which blocks Internet macros. You can also use these uh, ASR rules to 
say, for example, block all office applications from creating child processes or uh, block office applications from creating executable content, block office applications from injecting code into other processes. I mean, that all sounds very bad. And so, you know, unless you have a specific business need for some weird, um, you know, office macro or something that is supposed to do that, probably a good idea to just go ahead and block those. And again, you can block those via GPO, Intune, PowerShell. We had a whole episode on that. Um, recommend that you go back and listen to that. So, um, and finally, of course, you could just disable macros completely. Um, that is an option. But again, many organizations still use macros uh, for day-to-day business functions. Um, and if you're one of those organizations, you should you know, bring up this as a security concern. You should try to develop a strategy to replace them um, as soon as possible because it is more of a legacy method of you know, automation. Um, and hopefully there's better ways to do that these days. So that's, that's the, the nuts and bolts of it. Adam, Mm -hmm. you have any additional comments? Start by saying that we don't work on this team and, and, you know, we're not pretending to speak on behalf of them. We're really just commenting on the, you know, what's been shared publicly, which is all I've had access to. I haven't had um, any internal talking points or anything I've seen anyway. So it actually makes it really easy to just speak about this because I'm only commenting on on what's been shared publicly. I know in general from working in IT for a long time that defaults are really important to software publishers and that's because they have to serve a wide variety of use cases. And obviously Microsoft Office applications are used by businesses and individuals of all shapes and sizes, you know, from very large hundred thousand plus seat enterprises down to small businesses that employ under a hundred people. They all use and rely on Microsoft office to conduct business. And when you make default setting changes to the default behavior, that's a big deal because there's a lot of businesses out there that are just running the defaults just however it came out of the box, you know, they go buy a couple of PCs at office max or office depot. Um, and they throw Microsoft office on them and away they go. There's no it department. There's maybe an it guy that works part time, you know, between a couple of businesses and comes in, you know, 10 hours a week or something and just make sure the sky isn't falling. And I'd be willing to bet that when macros became blocked by default and should also clarify There are multiple channels through which the, and they're not even called the office apps anymore. They're technically called the Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise, um, how those apps are serviced. And so there's a current channel, there's a monthly channel, and there's a semi-annual channel. And the current channel and the semi-annual channel both have a preview channel in addition to those as well. So there's actually the current channel preview And there's the semi-annual channel preview. There isn't a monthly channel preview for whatever reason, but that's another subject for another time. To be clear, this default change was only in the current channel preview channel. So never made its way to the mainstream channel and was rolled back before it got to that point based on feedback. And we do have said publicly, we will bring this back. Like we still intend to do this. We're still going to block macros, internet macros by default. We want to make improvements to the experience, which I assume means like explaining ways to unblock it, um, especially in organizations that might not have like central IT. So for the most part, if you work in an enterprise and you have an InfoSec team, this isn't about you because you're already deploying these GPOs to block certain macros. Maybe you're using these attack surface reduction rules, which by the way, Andy, as you're reading those, create child processes, create executable content, inject code into other processes. Like that's all, turn those on by default, turn those on org wide and wait till somebody screams. It's like, that's just 
Like, why does that need to be on for anyone? Even your finance department isn't, doesn't have macros that are that crazy. So anyhow, long-winded, you know, conversation short. Defaults are hard. We're still going to do it, but we want to take time and, and improve the experience. If you have an InfoSec team, this is not of a concern to you anyways, because hopefully you're already blocking this. And if not, you can right now because you can deploy those changes um, via settings to your org. And you should. You should have macros blocked in all scenarios where they're not actively needed. Your finance department probably still needs them. Accounting, et cetera. Nobody else probably does at this point, unless you have some like uh, esoteric business unit that is still doing something with them. And you'll find it, you'll find it from the screaming if you turn this on. So just turn it on and wait for somebody to get mad. But like sometimes that's a really effective method of securing your organization is instead of being so paralyzed by we need to figure out every failure point ahead of time, as long as you're able to be agile in response to it, sometimes I'm okay with like breaking stuff and unbreaking it really quickly because that lets you throw a blanket of protection on and then just, just carving holes in it as needed. And that can be a really effective way to up your security game in a hurry. So I know not all orgs have that kind of willingness to do that. But if you are at a place where you haven't burned those bridges yet, sometimes that's the best way to go. So um, anyhow, it's coming back. And uh, for the most part, this is just one of those things, Andy, I like your analogy to IT, where we've all been there. We, we had a well-intentioned change, and there was just too much negative feedback to stick with it. And so we had to go back to the drawing board. And I think that's what's going on here, but it is confirmed it's coming back. So get ready um, and, and have a plan for that when it does. But again, it's really not for our listeners anyway. It's for orgs that don't have security people. Um, they're the only ones impacted by the defaults anyway. So anyhow. I will mention one more thing about this. There's another way to implement you know, how to block macros and security settings within Office specifically, which is going to config.office.com. Love it. If you haven't gone there to, to look at that, definitely go and look at it. Two benefits of that. Number one, if you're deploying them through MEM and GPO, they apply to the device. If you deploy them via config.office.com, they apply to your Office apps. Meaning, if you allow your users to download Office apps and sign into them on non-managed machines, for example, a lot of orgs allow their users to download additional copies of Office to install at home. That's a great benefit, but then you're accessing company data, like including OneDrive and Teams, on those unmanaged machines. Now, if you do that, you can configure those Office clients once they sign in to obey these configuration policies like blocking macros and all that. And they still apply to your managed machines as well. The other benefit of using config.office.com is when you look at these specific policies like blocking macros in you know, dot, um, .xls files only or something like that, um, you can check to see what percentage of your users are actually going to be impacted? And you can see like from the logs right there within config.office.com who is opening what documents and what percentage, um, you know, and, and daily um, activity is happening for that particular policy. So if only Adam is opening like a hundred documents a day that contain macros that are, that it's going to be blocked. And he's the only one I can then go to Adam and be like, Hey, what's going on with this particular thing? And then I can scope a policy for the rest of the org and scope an exception for him. If it's like a business critical thing. So highly recommend that you go there. This is a great way to not only be able to secure all office applications across the board. If you're not, you know, managing, all of your devices quite yet you can at least secure the office apps and then you can also see the impact right away how many users who they are what documents they're opening when they're opening it on the frequency and you can see you know if i do this policy nobody's going to be affected if i do this policy you know 20 percent are going to be affected that's probably not a good thing right so you can go through and at least scope the the low hanging fruit that is like 0% or 1%, you know, go from there. 
Love it. Great call out. I think a lot of uh, folks still aren't familiar with config.office.com and it's honestly the way to go moving forward anyway. So our final topic for tonight kind of, you know, is a continuation of the conversation that we've been having the last couple of weeks. You know, we started with patching, talked about vulnerability management. Um, and one of those things that happens today, if you aren't patched and you're not doing a good job in vulnerability management is ransomware. And we talked about how ransomware is still a thing and human operated ransomware being kind of the, you know, I don't know if the gold standard is the right word, but it's, it's one of the more feared types of ransomware where, you know, instead of just the commodity ransomware or what we would call just the pray and spray type, you know, firing a bunch of emails off, hoping someone clicks and hoping you don't have detection in place and it just encrypts versus a human or uh, maybe a nation state actor or associated with a ransomware group is scanning different environments, different vulnerabilities. They find it in, they may, you know, specifically disable or uninstall your antivirus software or disable your security services or, you know, locate and corrupt or delete backups before sending a ransomware demand, exfiltrating data, you know, before encrypting and then doing a, a, a double um, ransomware uh, or ransom um, uh, request uh, extortion. And so that is kind of the, the consequence of, of all that. So I found this great documentation published by the Microsoft Dart team, which is the Microsoft Detection and Response Team. And they are essentially a team that responds to not only internally for Microsoft, but also for our customers um, in an incident response situation. And they published this document on ransomware approach and best practices. And it details how they approach an incident when there is ransomware involved. And so I just wanted to kind of go over this. I highly, highly recommend that you go over this article. There's also going to be a ton of resources at the bottom, but this it gives you a great starting point to kind of build an incident response to really anything, honestly. Um, but for ransomware specifically, if you don't have a playbook or if you want to tweak it or kind of plagiarize some of the stuff that's in here, great place to start. So first off, you know, obviously being Microsoft, they're going to heavily use a lot of the Microsoft security solutions. If you have other things, you can certainly, you know, put in what you have. So for example, Defender for Endpoint is, you know, Microsoft's EDR solution. If you have a different EDR solution, you can look at that. But that's going to be, you know, kind of your bread and butter, looking at alerts, incidents, performing advanced hunting queries for IOCs, uh, real-time monitoring service for Microsoft threat experts. That is something that not everyone knows, but you can opt into that. And what they do is they look for um, ongoing suspicious activity if you have a large enough organization. And then we also have um, a separate service called Experts on Demand where uh, we can provide additional insights into alerts or IOCs or packages or anything like that that you want to submit. There's also Defender for Identity, which is our on-prem identity protection. There are similar solutions out there from other competitors, um, but this basically looks at malicious activities and compromised accounts for on-prem, um, your, your domain controllers, and you know, I can find an alert to you on things like DC sync attacks, reconnaissance attacks, remote code execution, pass the hash, pass the ticket, golden ticket. I mean, there's a ton that you can alert you to. And it's mainly dealing with compromised accounts. And actually, there's some integration coming that you'll be able to take action from Defender for Identity, which is actually a SaaS service that you can you know, take action to one of your compromised on-prem identities and disable them or reset the password. So um, kind of turning into a little bit of an EDR tool. Um, it used to just be alerts and now you, you're going to be able to take some action too. So um, also important as part of the stack for Dart. 
And then Defender for Cloud Apps, which is a CASB. Uh, it looks at unusual behavior across cloud apps, um, ransomware, compromised users, rogue uh, applications. I will also point out it looks at privileged OAuth applications, and it also has the ability to revoke those apps um, automatically if they're determined to be malicious. And so that's one of the, the big concerns on you know, users being able to OAuth uh, to different applications and sign in using their corporate credentials and then all of a sudden that service becomes compromised or was a compromised service to begin with um, and now it has privileged uh, information or um, access to your environment so um, the threat analytics of uh, defender for cloud apps has the ability to just revoke those automatically and then finally, Secure Score. Secure Score is you know something that comes with uh, Microsoft Security. Every organization has access to it. You're able to like look at your organization's security posture, and then look at different things to help improve your posture. So, for example, if you don't have MFA enabled, that's going to be at the top of the list. If you um, have um, other things like uh, if you don't have those ASR rules enabled, you know, maybe that's not at the top, but certainly it's going to be evaluating your devices and um, it'll give you that recommendation. So you can then take specific actions to improve that score over time. And it gives you a nice checklist to kind of go through and, you know, what should I focus on next? How do I make my organization safer? If you're unsure, secure score is a great place to go to and, and look. So when you showed this to me in the pre-show and we were talking through it, this this documentation in the show notes, you really got to check it out. If you're listening to the show, make sure you go click this link and review it. There's a ton of material here and there's links to even more material here. And this is one of the things like not to kind of get sappy about this, but I think we do really well is share stuff publicly, no cost, no charge, just literally on Microsoft Docs site, which is free to everyone, not paywalled, not no sign in required. Just you want to view it, knock yourself out. Don't need to, don't even need to sign in. Don't even need to prove your customer. Don't need to prove any, anything. And to your point, Andy, you kind of walk through what the different tools are and how Dart would use them, but you can generalize a lot of this information too. There's some uh, methodology here walking through kind of, okay, we think we have a, a security incident going on. How did we first become aware of it? Like, what are the steps we're going to go through um, to restore services, to get the scope of the situation, uh, to to eliminate the attacker from the environment? And it's just really, really good stuff. So really proud of this, but just again, a, a really great resource. And even if you're not a full Microsoft stack customer, which nobody is not even Microsoft, um, you can still get value from this and you can still generalize some of these findings and incorporate them into maybe your own uh, response process as well. So just great material here. Honestly, really proud of it. And um, I think a resource that everyone can learn from. And this is what I want to see more of. Obviously, the security business uh, is a, a large business and a growing business. And that's great. Capitalism, baby. Everyone's going to make some money from it. That's cool. Uh, but at the same time, the way we help protect ourselves, protect our organizations, is by doing more information sharing. So. Just, just love what I'm seeing here. Yeah, I went over the tools, but what you were talking about, Adam, was you know in here they published how they actually conduct their investigations, mm -hmm. and so oh, there's, I jumped there's three a steps. <laughs> yeah, there's three, and and you kind of said some of them, but like three steps here, and and we'll just go through these quickly, and and again, highly recommend because there's a lot of detail mm -hmm. in the article to to go through this, but you know, number one, assess the situation, right? Um, you know understand the scope, you know, what uh, were the alerts that first popped up? You know, when were they? What um, accounts or um, uh, devices were associated with them, right? Then number two, ad identify the affected line of business apps. Right? Get the systems back online 
Um, does the application require a specific identity? Are there backups? Um, are the backups um, verified and uh, still good? Um, and then determine the compromise recovery process. So remove the attacker from the environment. Um, so it's kind of a generalized, and then there's a lot of detail within under each particular section. So you can go through and look at that. And then they have best practices, right? So number one for containment, you know, they look at um, assessing the scope and then preserving the existing systems. And within the preserving existing systems, um, there's some really good bullet points here, like disabling all privileged user accounts, except for a small number that are being used by your admins to assist in resetting the integrity of your infrastructure. Um, and if a user account is to believe to be compromised, disable it immediately. Um, isolate compromised systems from the network, uh, but do not shut them off. You know, so that's, that's a big one. Um, because a lot, I think our gut reaction is to just turn it off, pull the plug. Um, but if you do that, you might lose some forensic, um, evidence. Right. And so, um, that's, that's something, uh, that, not everyone may know because your, your gut instinct is just to turn it right off. Um, you need to isolate one known good domain controller in every domain. Two is even better. And so going through this list, preserving different existing systems, you know, some really good information here. And then some other tactical things uh, for containment. Uh, like this one here, again, I had I not read this particular uh, document, I wouldn't even thought about it. But resetting the krbtgt password for your domain controller you know twice in rapid succession consider using a scripted repeatable process i mean that's not something that i would have known or even thought of um, and so this is something that you can put in your playbook and have something ready to go just in case you know, deploy a group policy to the entire domain that prevents a privileged logon domain admins to anything but a domain controller and privileged administrative only workstations, if any. Um, that's fairly good practice anyways. Um, if you haven't done that, I know it's by default, domain admins have administrative access to every single uh, machine in the domain. But I think it's good security practice to limit that anyways. Um, and so that's what they're saying here is that may be a containment action, but in my opinion, that, that should be actually something that you should work through to try to get so that your domain admins are just for your domain controllers and you have maybe a server admin for local admin to your servers and then your help desk can have local admin to your workstations. But, you know, if you're a server guy, there should be no reason to have local admin to endpoints, right? And so, you know, that's that separation of duty and just kind of limiting the blast radius of any type of attack. So, um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of good stuff in here. Post incident activities, you know, like um, following zero trust security practices, uh, using PAM or um, uh, privileged access um, management. Um, that's another, another thing if you haven't done that to evaluate um, not only just identities, but also, also workstations, like privileged access workstations. And so that's something that you should be getting towards. Some organizations, it may be difficult if you're not as mature in your security posture, but um, I mean, pause are a great thing to help limit administrative access, especially if you can um, use conditional access and make sure, for, you know, at least for the cloud, um, environments maybe have a specific paw just for your global admin and have another paw for domain admins because they're separate environments um, you may not want to mix that um, and, it, and it has something in here for laps as well um, if you're not familiar with laps it's the uh, local administrator um, where you know it's rotating the password for the default administrator on your domain join machines and so that's, that's a good thing um, because then you don't have to set your local administrator to the same password, which some organizations, if they haven't deployed laps, that's what they're doing. They're using administrator and then a, a set, you know, maybe like company name 2021, you know, exclamation mark, uh, something like that. Um, and, and then it's shared. Um, so that's not a good thing. You want to deploy laps. So 
Um, but yeah, again, a lot of really good information in here. Uh, when I read through this, I learned a few things. I would put some things in my playbook. Um, I'm sure anyone who has any type of incident response playbook will be able to compare notes and update different things that you may not have thought of. So um, we will put this link in the show notes for everyone uh, to review and hopefully you, you have some time to do that. And that's our show for this week. Thanks as always for listening and watching. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or topics that you want us to talk about on future shows. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.